will bear with me. I'm uh, one of these strange Europeans that tries to speak uh, English, and I always say in America that uh, I feel very much at home because Americans aren't the only ones who can't speak English. I have great difficulty as a, a German uh, citizen uh, myself. Now, uh, when I went to college, uh, I was told by the professors, uh, better never than late. But um, I realized that in America you say better late than never, so uh, I, um, I'm very thankful for your generosity. Now, Lapland. I presume you know where Lapland is. Mm. Some people are nodding, some people are shaking their heads. Well, who could tell me? Oh, you've been to my uh, lecture before, sir. You should know. Uh, who could tell me? You, sir? Finland. Uh, um, Lapland is I I also in Finland. In fact, the Finnish language is uh, um, a sort of weaker developed form um, of the uh, Lap language. Where else? Sweden and Norway. Yeah, Sweden and Norway. Yes, and another country? Russia. Uh, Russia, that's right. And there are actually Laps in the north of Scotland in uh, Great Britain. Uh, and uh, that surprises many, many people. Um, now, um, when I was uh, 13 years of age, I felt somehow or other that uh, my home place in Yorkshire, in England, where I belonged to a minority people who spoke a language which is partly Celtic and partly Scandinavian, and uh, people in that tiny district where I lived never felt at home in England and never called themselves English, I, uh, I believed that I was uh, uh, destined to uh, go, thank you, to go and live in the continent of Europe. And uh, uh, when I was uh, a teenager, my favourite country was Sweden. So I started diligently learning Swedish. And uh, I'm saying this because if you people are called to the mission field, it's no use getting a missionary society to pay for your uh, trip to the mission field and all your studies there of the language and having you been useless for three or four years until you learn to preach and teach in that foreign language. If you feel called uh, uh, to the mission field, you, better, you had better start learning that language now because God, in his graciousness, um, got me to uh, learn Swedish in my teens so that when I was called to Swedish Lapland I could then uh, from the very start preach in that language now when I was uh, 16 I went to live in Sweden and met the Laps and uh, I wasn't a Christian at first but the Lord most graciously converted me in Sweden and then I went uh, to England, to London, to study at the London Bible College and London University so that I could go back to Lapland uh, and work there as a missionary. And um, I was uh, without any financial uh, aid at all and um, the Lord wonderfully took care of all my needs. And whilst I was at college... I, um, I uh, received a letter from a missionary in uh, Lapland, a man called Franz Oscar Linde. There's a picture of him. He became my great hero in the Lord. I'll pass that around. And um, uh, this missionary asked me, um, well, he gave me my Macedonian call, come over to Lapland and help us. Now, the uh, vacation was just around the corner and at college we had uh, about um, uh, 10 weeks uh, uh, vacation. And so I applied to uh, uh, my mentors in the college 
uh, to be given permission to go to uh, Lapland. And they all said, no. So I asked, why? Because I felt, well, this is the Lord's will. And they said, uh, well, uh, you have to do what the college tells you. They were very, very strict in those days. So I said, well, why doesn't the college tell me to go to Lapland? Because I've got an invitation. No, we've something else for you to do. And they said, besides, uh, you owe the college a hundred pounds, which was a fortune in those days, and I didn't, uh, I didn't know that I had any debts at all, because I had to pray in those days for each piece of writing paper, each pen, each razor blade, each pair of socks, and uh, um, throughout the period of my studies, uh, things just came um, uh, when I prayed for them uh, the Lord was very very gracious um, uh, to me but here was a debt of a hundred pounds uh, which I had to work off in the holidays and pay the college well I thought this is a setback but I was so convinced that the Lord would have me out there in Lapland so uh, I tried to bargain with the uh, college chaplain who was chosen to advise me uh, in these matters. And I said, now it's Friday. If um, uh, the Lord sends me uh, that hundred pounds by Monday, and it'll have to come in the Monday post because there's no post uh, over the weekend, uh, could I uh, then go to Lapland? and um, the college chaplain took a deep breath and I could see the wheels of his brains uh, turning around and he was wondering what he should do and finally he smiled and he said, he said yes, it's a bargain right, so I went to, to my digs is that an American word? Uh, all my digs are my lodgings uh, that's European student slang I went to my digs uh, and uh, I prayed and prayed and prayed and um, I thought well nobody knows about this and so uh, if the thing doesn't come off you know uh, I won't have to be ashamed because nobody knows but somehow that chaplain of mine had told all the students and everybody was thinking, what's going to happen on Monday morning? Is George Ella going to get to Lapland or not? Well, Monday morning came, and the very, very nervous uh, George Ella, with uh, knees knocking, uh, went to his little pigeonhole in the college. Is that a term that you Americans use? A pigeonhole is a little place where your post is put. Uh, and uh, it's a little shelf and you take out your post in the mornings and I crept to my pigeon hole but to my great astonishment and, uh, uh, and fear uh, all the college students were all collected around my pigeon hole right I put in my hand and got out my post and I looked through letter after letter with everybody looking over my shoulder and I saw a letter from my mother and that wasn't a letter because she was as, as stony broke as I am uh, and uh, as I was, well still am uh, and uh, um, I went through all these uh, uh, this post and then I saw a letter in a strange handwriting and the postmark was from a place I'd never heard of and I opened the letter and there was a postal order a kind of check for a hundred pounds I do not know to this day how that money uh, got into that envelope and who put that money uh, into that envelope I never found out well I was off to um, Lapland before you can say uh, at Jack Robinson and I hitchhiked um, to the coast and um, I did have uh, enough money for uh, the boat across to Denmark Denmark is of course thousands of uh, miles from Lapland and um, I uh, hitchhiked uh, up there well my adventure started straight away a car pulled up in Esbe that's uh, um, a port in uh, Denmark 
and a young couple got out and said uh, we're going up to Sweden would you like to join us and so I said you bet and uh, I was in the car speeding for Sweden the Lord will provide when we got to uh, Malmö on the Swedish uh, border um, we came to the customs office and uh, instead of stopping and getting the car checked the driver put his foot down and we speeded off at um, uh, an enormous uh, speed and soon we had the titu tita that's the noise that uh, uh, police cars make uh, over there they make a, a far different noise here I know but I can't imitate it anyway there was this titu tita behind us and suddenly we were surrounded by police cars and um, the police got out our, uh, my driver stopped and they asked him what he was doing speeding through the uh, uh, customs uh, area and uh, my driver said that he had nothing to declare and so he thought he could just drive on so the police and customs officials got out their tools and uh, they started taking the car to pieces and they found nothing suspicious and so they allowed us to drive on well my uh, um, my uh, driver drove on for a couple of miles and then stopped the car and began to laugh and laugh and his wife uh, began to laugh and laugh and I wondered what on earth was wrong with the two of them and then they winked at me and uh, they pulled out a very very long screwdri screwdriver went to the, the back of the car we call it a boot I think you call it a trunk and uh, they opened the trunk screwed out a false bottom in the trunk and it was completely full of smuggled goods so I was going to be a missionary to the laps to take the gospel to the laps and professional smugglers uh, were used of the Lord to take me there but you can understand that I didn't wait until I um, preached the gospel uh, to the laps I gave that young couple a good talking to about the ways of the Lord well I uh, came up to Lapland um, the Laps are uh, um, a very tiny people They're, um, uh, uh, they are brachycephalic which is a technical word for high cheekbones used for uh, uh, Mongol type uh, people and uh, they look a bit Chinese-ish um, if I can use that word and they're very tiny and I who am quite small felt for the first time in my life that I was uh, like uh, a giant uh, amongst the uh, uh, Lilliput uh, people and um, they, um, they dress very elaborately and very colourfully um, I have a picture here of um, um, two elderly people they were actually called the king and queen of Lapland this lady is called Regina which means queen and the gentleman is called uh, Andersh and uh, they're uh, standing outside their house there and uh, they kindly allowed me to photograph them um, when this goes by you'll notice the elaborate uh, designs on their clothing that is all uh, done with uh, silver thread could you pass that around please now uh, they, um, they take huge uh, chunks of uh, silver and they force it into their mouths so they have a mouth full of silver and they chew the silver till it, uh, until it's uh, quite pliable and then they have a long bone and uh, at the one end of the bone there's a very big hole and then the holes get smaller and smaller and smaller and uh, they uh, uh, take the silver and pull it through a big hole in the bone and then they pull it through a lesser hole and then a smaller hole until it's fine thread and then they sew these um, beautiful uh, um, garments uh, which they wear uh, with this um, silver thread now uh, I didn't have uh, um, a case big enough to bring a whole uh, uh, set of uh, lap uh, clothing with me but uh, this is a typical lap working hat it's not uh, the best uh, 
uh, their Sunday best um, but their hats look like this and uh, imagine their clothing um, fits uh, the hat it's of the same material um, here there's a very simple design showing which clan the laps belong to but in their, uh, in their um, sort of best clothing this would be all decorated in beautiful colours and in silver well I soon found that when the laps went into their houses they, uh, which are uh, just planks of wood surrounded by um, um, birch bark and then with uh, sods from the earth fitted on them when they went into their houses they always got their hats turned them inside out like this and they had a little loop there and then they hung these up inside their little houses which are called coters so I said why do you always do that why do you turn your houses uh, your sorry your, uh, um, your hats inside out and they said oh you soon find out and we sat down um, with the wood fire in the middle of the cota and there was a big hole in the roof to let the smoke out and it started to rain and so the man of the house went out climbed up a, a little ladder on the side of the uh, cota and he put a lid on the hole to keep the rain out and then we were gathered there and the smoke uh, got thicker and thicker and thicker and soon I noticed there was dirt on my face and then I saw their hats and they got nicely covered in uh, soot and he, the uh, man of the house said to me now you know uh, why we do this with our hats because uh, when they go out they want to look nice and clean and tidy and they turn their hats back uh, the right side out and there they have a nice beautiful clean hat on their heads and I thought oh my that's a good sermon illustration you know man looks at the outside but uh, um, the Lord looks on the heart the inside and so many of us want to have a beautiful clean exterior to show everybody but inside oh dear what do we look like all soot and dirt right now uh, I uh, soon found out that moving amongst the laps was not an easy task they are semi-nomad they're still in Scandinavia and this means uh, mostly in um, the uh, uh, winter time they are on the move and uh, they are on the move at temperatures in uh, um, Sweden of uh, 48 to 60 degrees uh, of frost and uh, this is centigrade um, and uh, you have Fahrenheit um, but um, just think of it as cold as it ever gets here and it gets much colder there and they're on the move uh, there are no roads and um, they move on skis in the summer uh, they have to uh, plough through very boggy land because the snow, snow melts and stays there uh, on the ground and it's all swampy out there and I had a pair of very low shoes and a very thin pair of calico uh, breeches and I soon found that I just couldn't make any headway just slushing through this mud so I had to get a pair of boots they have very long leather boots covered in rubber there and um, I looked into my uh, pocket and I had either enough money to buy a pair of these boots or enough money to get the boat back to uh, England so what should I do well I thought this is the Lord's work I'd better get the boots so we went in a little village to a boot shop and sure enough I found the boots um, there that I needed uh, which took away every penny I had in my pocket but I thought this is the Lord's work so I bought these big boots and uh, we went home to Franz Oscar the, um, the gentleman whose uh, portrait you've seen and uh, we were hardly there ten minutes when there's a knock at the door and we opened the door and there was the shopkeeper 
with a very bashful look on his face. And so he said, come in, gave him a coffee, a cup of coffee, wherever you are in Sweden, uh, you get a cup of coffee put into your hands. There's a lady uh, nodding, so I presume you've been there and, and know the ropes. Uh, I haven't been there, but I grew up in very Swedish, where I'm from in Minnesota, and wherever you go, you get coffee. Oh, yes, so... You, they, it's just the same today uh, 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 you get a cup of coffee and then they offer you uh, shoes uh, sort of kakor which means seven kinds of cakes and they always have to have those handy and um, uh, you get these seven different kinds of cakes or, or uh, um, biscuits now um, the gentleman said I want to confess to you that um, I was a very keen Christian and uh, I was in love with the Lord and I used to serve him diligently and then I started my shoe shop and I got interested in one thing only making money and when you two gentlemen came to my shop and uh, you were talking about uh, giving your last penny for a pair of boots in, uh, to serve the Lord in my conscience struck me and he said, the Lord has now told me that I've been a very wicked man to put my business before the Lord and um, the Lord has ta taught me a great lesson and I've brought you the money back for the boots. And so uh, I, was, uh, I, I received the money back and there was my fare to get uh, from uh, Norway, Oslo, uh, back to England. Well, I, um, I um, had a wonderful time of blessing, daily blessings uh, with the Lord uh, through those weeks and um, um, in God's grace, when I got qualified, I was able to go back to um, Lapland and work full time amongst uh, the Laps. Um, now, how did the Laps uh, come to uh, know of Christ? Well, uh, in Europe, uh, most people knew about Christ uh, um, in uh, the first millennium um, after Christ. Um, in England, uh, they f found out about the Lord Jesus Christ um, perhaps um, 50 or 60 years um, after Christ um, AD. In Germany, a short time later, in France very early indeed in Spain very early indeed and of course in Italy in uh, Bible times uh, but Lapland did not know anything of the Lord Jesus Christ up to the end of the 14th century so we're in the uh, later Middle Ages and how did they hear about the Gospel? Well um, the, the first missionary to the Laps was uh, a lap girl herself called Margareta who we believe was only 12 years of age Margareta had heard through some French uh, travellers that there was uh, um, a person called the Lord Jesus Christ who had uh, um, suffered on the cross the penalty and the punishment of uh, all their sins and that uh, uh, through receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal saviour they could get rid of their condemnation and guilt and stand guiltless before God and be finally accepted into God's heaven and live eternally with him and she thought if only we could find somebody who could come to Lapland and tell us about this saviour now Margareta lived right in the very north near the um, Arctic Circle and the queen who was also called Margareta the queen of the Swedes and the Danes they were one country then she lived right down in the south in a place called Lund and uh, Margareta decided to make this uh, uh, tremendous and terribly long journey to uh, Lund and we don't, know, we don't know how she got there we, uh, she, of course there were no, no uh, cars and buses and airplanes in those days uh, presumably she just walked 
and uh, she eventually got to Lund and um, she went to the palace and because of her appearance in her lap clothing she caused quite a sensation nobody had ever seen a person dressed like that before and uh, she was given entrance to the queen and she told the queen her story now Queen Margareta was a Christian in fact in her reign the, um, she had the Bible translated into Swedish um, Sweden was one of the first countries in the western world to have a Bible in their own language long before England and long before even Germany and the Luther translation and, but she wasn't a, a very good uh, at uh, uh, evangelization she didn't know much about it at all so she gathered her bishops around and said bishops how are we going to how are we going to get the laps to become Christians so the bishops um, sadly stupid as they were they said well all your majesty has to do is to uh, um, uh, make a document compile a document in Latin of course the language of the church and declare officially that Lapland has become a Christian nation this is true, this is the historical fact I'm not exaggerating at all so one of the bishops went up to Lapland uh, went into all the villages and encampments unrolled his scroll and said uh, um, that this day hath uh, the Queen of Sweden uh, concluded that uh, you Lap citizens are uh, uh, now citizens of heaven and Christian citizens. Now, uh, I suppose you don't think that helped much, that helped much <laughs> at all, or is somebody convinced that would have converted them all at once? I know there are no royalists here. Right, um, uh, it didn't, it didn't uh, help at all. And the bishops showed great disdain to these laps. You see, uh, what is a lap? Well, in... Uh, Sweden, uh, this is a lap, a dirty rag. Uh, we call laps laps, and we do them in injustice because that's the word the Swedes have given them. The Swedes, uh, even today, they despise the laps. They call them laps, which is a dirty rag. Their own name is Sami. They're the Sami people, and uh, they live in Sami Etnad, which is Lapland and they speak a language called Sami Sami um, um, and uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they look upon their language with great pride as a golden language Sami Giela Guli Giela they say uh, our lap language is a golden language and uh, they notice straight away that these bishops thought they were just laps so every time you say lap to a person from uh, Lapland, you're insulting him or her. He's a Sami and he speaks Samisk or Sami. The Swedish, in, in Swedish the word is Samisk and in the, their language it's Sami. <coughs> most of the Swedes speak either Swedish, most of the Laps sorry, speak either Swedish, Finnish, Norwegian or uh, Russian because they have uh, uh, approximately nine of their own languages which are sometimes limited to just a small number of people, say 150 people, and so when they uh, meet uh, one another, uh, they, uh, they speak uh, one of these other three languages. Now, uh, the bishop's proclamation didn't work, and so the bishops thought, how are we going to get the uh, uh, laps to become Christians? So, one dark night, they, oh, I must tell you that they asked permission, of course, and uh, to uh, uh, educate uh, 12 of um, the lap boys, and their parents refused because uh, uh, you can't go to the labor exchange and get workers in Lapland. The only workers you have is your family. And uh, that's why they have many children. Uh, lots of the laps I visited had 16 children. Uh, because that was their workforce and uh, of course they wouldn't give up their children so the bishops decided to go one night and kidnap 12 boys and they actually took 12 sacks this is recorded in history 
and uh, each packed uh, a boy into a sack and uh, roped it up, threw it on their backs and they were away down to the south of um, Sweden. On the way several of the boys died, several ran away and never got back home and in all, after a period of years, they only managed to train one boy as a minister and they sent him back to Lapland. By this time, he'd become quite a snob, didn't want anything to do with his own people. His own people did not recognize him. He'd forgotten the language, and um, he was just a foreigner to them, and uh, nothing came of it. Well, by this time, Margareta was growing up into a young lady, and she went to a place called Vardstena. That is the place in Sweden where the Bible was translated and uh, uh, the person who set up this translation was not a famous uh, uh, masculine uh, manly uh, uh, theologian but a f very fine lady called Brigitta and it was through uh, Brigitta Birgit um, as they say in, in Sweden that uh, the Swedes uh, got their Bible and Margareta visited these ladies and they led her to Christ and she was then able to go back to Lapland as their first Christian uh, missionary. Um, now, uh, I must tell you that when you go out to the mission field you must not do the stupid things uh, I did. Um, I... Um, um, I heard of uh, a Lap old people's home and um, uh, I knew the nurse who was in charge of that home and I thought uh, I was uh, always joking always pulling people's leg, uh, legs and I thought I would, uh, I would um, cause quite a sensation in that Lap people's home and uh, have them all laughing their heads off and I would become very acceptable then and then I would uh, uh, be able to talk to them about the Lord. So what did I do? Well, I used to love acting. So I thought, I'll disguise myself as a lap. And I went to a, a man um, who, was, um, who was something of an actor himself and he had a full lap costume. And uh, I put on this costume and he uh, made me up um, very skillfully to look uh, um, something like a lap and uh, I bowed uh, uh, myself uh, like this and I walked as the laps always uh, walk and um, I uh, went up to this uh, home for old laps knocked at the door and uh, presented myself as a lap goober an old, uh, an old lap and I wanted to uh, um, have a place in the home and uh, uh, the people all crowded around me and looked at me and then uh, this um, nurse who I knew who was the warden she came in with a great big pile of newly washed linen and she came in and saw me and went ah! <laughs> and uh, all the linen went up into the air and the lady almost fainted in fright and then all the labs started uh, um, calling me all sorts of names for, uh, um, for making such an uh, appearance. At first I seemed to have deceived them and then but soon of course when they looked nearer they gathered that I, I was a fake. So uh, my first big entree amongst uh, the labs was as a fake lap. Uh, never become a fake anything uh, when you go onto the mission field. Be your honest self and you'll get on very uh, much better because it took quite some time for these people to, uh, to forgive and forget my silliness but actually they did then become my friends and they gave me a lap name uh, Samanas Ven which means friend of the laps and how I got that name well um, I went uh, I've still time haven't I I went uh, on my first preaching engagement uh, on my own without my friend Franz Oscar and I went to a place called Jensmesholm 
and there I tried to uh, gather the laps together to preach the gospel but when they saw me uh, they just went like this and I gather that you Americans you told me go like this so you know what that means uh, this uh, crazy foreigner we want nothing to do with him and everywhere I went I said uh, would you come to uh, my meeting and uh, listen to the gospel and they just went like this and so there was a Swedish house a farmer's house in the neighbourhood and I went there and I said could you tell me why the Laps do not want to hear the gospel he said oh I don't blame them so I said oh you don't want to hear the gospel too he said oh I'm a Christian I, I love the gospel but then why do you say you don't blame the Laps so he said uh, only yesterday the following story happened uh, there were people who were very Pentecostal in nature they belonged to a, a group of people called Maranatha which you recognize as a good biblical word but these people um, said to the Laps now what's wrong with you is that you have Christian doctrine what you want to know is that the time of doctrine has gone we are in the, uh, uh, the uh, era of miraculous gifts now I want to tell you said the, this minister that you can do anything through Christ who strengthens you so I said to my, uh, um, uh, my Swedish friend, well, I believe that too. He said, no. He told them they could do anything through Christ who strengthens you. So I still didn't understand. So I said, yes, but we can. He said, no, anything, anything. And I began to realize what he meant. They thought they were led to believe that uh, they could do just anything they wanted. Uh, because Christ was in them and they were free people and he said this is what happened yesterday one of the laps uh, believed he was converted and believed the minister and he went around shouting I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and he came to my house because it's the biggest house in the district and without asking permission he just stormed through the house went up the stairs and stood on the rooftop and he stood facing below my, uh, uh, my, my uh, cow dung heap or what do you call it in, uh, in English uh, manure. Uh, manure? Manure. Ma manure pile and he stood on the uh, he was a farmer and he stood on the roof and said I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me come and see and everybody crowded around to see this great sight and then suddenly this uh, poor lap he said I can fly and he took off from the rooftop and swoosh he flew at breakneck speed uh, belly first right into the uh, uh, manure pile hmm? well now you can understand why the people thought what another of these crazy Christians uh, so I said to my friend how am I going to get these people together so he said there's a big bell in the centre of the village it's only rung in cases of emergency uh, and that gathers all the people together so I thought this is a case of emergency so I went to the bell and I started ringing it uh, like the Americans used to ring old liberty and uh, um, then all the people gathered round and then I preached to them on uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me telling them that all things are possible but not all things are uh, edifying and uh, I taught them the difference between possible uh, and liberty in Christ and using that li uh, liberty edifyingly right there were some there were some tourists there uh, Swedish tourists and standing near me was a very venerable uh, lap the leader of the community and one of these uh, Swedish tourists a young lady she, she was only about 25 she came up to my dear friend put her hand uh, behind his collar like this 
and she said, I want to see if you dirty laps ever wash yourself. And uh, he said to me, I feel worsely treated um, than, uh, this was his, ex his exact words, um, I feel w uh, worse treated than Negroes in America because that was the time of the racist revolts and things like that and uh, I uh, stood before these laps turned to the Swedes and gave them a piece of my mind and a piece of the gospel right um, <laughs> just a few a few days later I was at home I lived a hundred kilometers from anywhere right out in the wilderness and uh, suddenly a bus stopped in uh, front of my house and a big parcel was thrown out and uh, I, uh, I thought well I'm the only one who lives here that parcel must be uh, for me and so I went to the side of the road and I untied the parcel and it was full of delicious smoked reindeer meat and there was a notice on the meat and it said till Salmoners Ben uh, excuse me very moving uh, for me uh, to relate this and uh, uh, that was to the friend of the laps and this was the laps way of saying thank you very much for supporting us and uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, protecting us and for defending us and uh, from that day on no lap ever went like this uh, to me wherever I went I had open doors I could expound the scriptures I went to the laps when they were slaughtering their reindeer they were there covered in blood from head to foot and they would just put their tools down and listen to the gospel and uh, I had a most blessed time with those people well uh, my time here is uh, almost up too I was told that uh, you would like to ask me uh, a lot of questions uh, if you have no questions I could tell you story after story um, so uh, don't you worry that I've uh, you know I've nothing more to say uh, I've plenty but I'd like to hear what you have to say yes sir um. Uh, y yes, uh, that's right. Well, I did uh, um, uh, a master's uh, degree at uh, Hull uh, after that, and I, I specialised in uh, uh, educational methods for uh, um, backward uh, uh, pupils, in particular um, Down syndrome uh, pupils. But then um, I became a member of the Swedish church there in Hull, and uh, um, they had lots of uh, newspapers there, and I looked through the situations vacant uh, in the newspapers, and there was uh, an ad from Lapland. Uh, it was uh, a school for Laps who were looking for a teacher. Now I visited this school uh, on, on this vacation uh, trip to Lapland. I knew the people there and I applied and uh, I got the uh, position there. It was working uh, in the inner mission of the Lutheran Church and um, I was accepted and went off straight away. Mm. So that's how I eventually got there a as a teacher. Mm. Yes? Sir. Um, can you tell about the first person um, yes, uh, I'll tell it uh, with shame, actually. Do uh, you mean the first person that I was able to lead to Christ? Well, I, um, uh, this is a mist that happened. Um, we were um, on, uh, on our way to um, um, a place called uh, Uccia Legret. Uh, and um, there was a family of uh, laps there called uh, Matson. And um, we, um, we were in a hurry to get there and we had uh, forgotten to commit ourselves to the Lord for that day. And soon after we were on our way, a great uh, pitch black fog um, uh, came down and um, uh, we were just lost. And I said to Franz Oscar, 
uh, don't worry I've uh, a compass and we've got the map we'll find our way and we walked over the hills there there was still snow there um, although it was in the middle of summer uh, the, the um, um, rivers are still frozen there on midsummer day and uh, I, we went by compass and um, um, suddenly after an hour or so I uh, saw a stone uh, in the ground uh, and a mark where it had been kicked and left a, a trail uh, in the track and I realized uh, that I had kicked that stone an hour before in other words we were walking around in circles getting nowhere and uh, um, suddenly we realized you know we we hadn't asked the, the Lord's uh, blessing on, on this day and so we sat down on a big piece of granite and we prayed that the Lord would forgive us the Lord would uh, um, get us safely to this meeting and that the fog would clear up and this was one of the uh, greatest moments of, of my life because as soon as we finished praying we opened our eyes and uh, the fog just lifted like a huge curtain and there below we saw um, one of the Matson family who rode, rode over the lake their home was on an island and he was waiting uh, for us to go down there and take us to his home well um, when we got there it was my turn to uh, preach Francisca had a piano accordion and he would play and sing a, a song like How Great Thou Art um, Americans think that's a, a Russian song but it's a, a Swedish song uh, a man called Buber uh, wrote it in, in the early 19th century we sang such songs and then I had to preach and uh, I, I, um, I was so nervous and uh, here were these people non-Christians wanting to hear the gospel from me and I just don't know what I said I was so nervous uh, and uh, I was trying to speak uh, um, from the Psalms and I just I had no idea what I was talking about and uh, I was having difficulty finding the words and finally I, um, I said my Amen and I dashed out to my little kota and I cried my eyes out and I asked the Lord's forgiveness and uh, I uh, opened um, um, the Psalms and I read those words bow down thine ear to me dear Lord because I am poor and needy right and then suddenly the whole family came into the little co uh, kota and they said oh praise the Lord our eyes have been opened the Lord has spoken to us uh, we've seen we've s sorry we've, s we've seen the glory of the Lord and I couldn't believe my ears or my eyes but whatever I said the Lord had said it not me and these people were grounded and built up in the faith and I had several such wonderful wonderful um, um, experiences and the Lord sends you out as people who in yourself are totally useless that's what I always found and he is able to supply all your needs and I believe too that when you realize that when you realize you can do nothing then the Lord can do everything through you this was also my uh, experience when I went to uh, um, Germany I, um, I had to uh, preach very early when I just got there because uh, a pastor uh, was on holiday and the church was without a shepherd and they asked me to witness to them and uh, the first time uh, I preached there in Germany I was able to uh, lead a young lady to the Lord although my, my German was still very weak 
and I have never got over the stage fright I have when um, speaking to people uh, but when the Lord calls you uh, you can gladly go and you know that he will equip you <laughs> so, another question I'm sorry I'm, I'm so emotional at times but uh, um, this is bringing back so many memories um, that um, I um, uh, you know I'm reliving them telling you um, oh perhaps I should tell you that um, about um, um, uh, a very 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 precious uh, lady who dedicated her life uh, to the laps who I, I had the privilege to meet the royal family in Scandinavia both the Norwegians and the uh, um, Swedish royal families have a long long tradition of service to the laps uh, you remember uh, the recent marriage of a Norwegian princess well she worked uh, uh, almost full time amongst the laps too and they have some fine Christian people and uh, um, when in, uh, whilst I was there in Lapland I met with several members of the royal family who were working full time as missionaries amongst the laps and this is how I met the first one uh, it was very very cold in the middle of the winter out there and I was sitting in front of a log fire um, thanking the Lord that I was there and not out uh, uh, wandering amongst the lap villagers they're called villagers although we would say clans uh, the villagers are not buildings but people and they're always on the move and suddenly in the middle of the night there was a loud knock at the door and uh, I thought who is disturbing my peace at this time and I went and opened the door and was blown back because of the wind and all the snow came in and uh, uh, there was a bundle um, uh, standing before me much much smaller than me and covered in layers of clothing and uh, um, the person's face was just covered in ice crystals and uh, I, I realized somebody was in distress so I pulled the thing or the person or whatever it was uh, into, uh, into uh, the, um, uh, my living room and uh, I started unwrapping all uh, these layers of clothing and I got off layer after layer after layer um, uh, they, um, out there they, they wear long coats to the ground of dog skin with wolf skin uh, collars and uh, after I'd taken off about three layers I realised uh, the it before me was a she and so uh, I, uh, I uh, turned my back and said you must do it uh, you must uh, um, take off your things yourself and uh, uh, the lady unwrapped uh, and unwrapped all these layers of clothing they were there in a wet pile on the uh, floor and uh, then uh, I said to her Vemerdu who are you? she looked so strange an old wrinkled woman and she said uh, and Kurt said Jorge Grevin and Shelf I am the countess herself that's how they speak uh, uh, in Sweden and it was the sister of uh, the former king of uh, uh, Sweden and uh, she, was, uh, she was about 76 at the time and she was uh, spending all her life travelling uh, amongst the Swedes uh, the, the Laps, sorry and she was the lady who set up this old people's home for the Laps where, uh, uh, where I uh, made a fool of myself um, this home was very necessary because just up to the 50s if uh, a lap old person um, was uh, too old to work or too old to move um, they were killed in a merciless way um, just where I lived there was a, a mountain was there? Uh, and it was like it was like this it went up there and then went down like that so that was the, uh, the boggy land and they called it Midaxfjell which means midday mountain because it took uh, uh, from early morning to noon uh, to climb up this slope 
And what happened with the old people who could not uh, keep up with the uh, nomadic life, uh, they were just taken up here by their children and thrown down over the mountainside. Now this, uh, uh, this went on uh, until the 40s and 50s. Or in the winter they would just uh, uh, go out onto the lake, here we have the lake, and uh, dig a hole in the ice and just put their uh, uh, parents uh, through the hole in the ice and forget them. And this lady who came to visit me, she started uh, uh, a missionary organization to look after these old Latv people. Oh, uh, anything else? Sorry, I'm going on and on, but uh, uh, perhaps you'll find it informative. Mm, any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, just so you know, today we'll be eating lunch with Dr. Ratledge. I assume over here in the, in the cafeteria, so if you want to talk to George, you don't have time afterwards. We'll be around, I think, most of the day. So. Yes. Okay. yes. We were talking please. a little bit earlier about uh, the difference between people who are time-oriented, which I would imagine an Englishman who lives who is now a German citizen would be very time-oriented as compared to people who are more event-oriented. And it's, it's my oh, yes, that's true. That the laps are, are more event-oriented rather than time oh yes they, they live according to the seasons the seasons are their times uh, their seasons are um, the roundup when they lasso the reindeers they herd all the reindeer together uh, lasso them and cut a piece out of their ear so that they will know which reindeer belongs to um, who and that's one of the big seasons um, that's in the late spring when the calves are, um, are born and up and running uh, and then they have the slaughter period in the uh, the um, um, oh, what's it called in English in uh, autumn, fall in the fall and uh, um, then uh, they, they slaughter the animals in the fall because uh, the uh, um, skins don't uh, oh dear I'm searching for words now don't lose their hair they don't molt mo right. what's the word right. molt. Molt. molt yes thank you and um, they um, uh, uh, then the third um, the third big highlight is uh, at midsummer and they have uh, their uh, trading fairs and uh, then all the laps get together and they call it a lap mesa and uh, uh, you can buy reindeer meat goods uh, um, shoes, their leather shoes with the turned up toes and, uh, and clothing uh, and things like that and those are the three, uh, the three sort of uh, periods uh, around which they uh, orientate their lives but you see we're talking about a people who, has, uh, uh, who have six months sunshine in the summer and uh, six months darkness in the winter and so uh, our 24 hour system just doesn't work there it, it, it's a six month system uh, and uh, um, uh, the laps are very jocular and flamboyant and joyful in the summer and then in the winter they get what they call the lap sickness and they get very depressed uh, and sadly they often turn to uh, alcohol and uh, you can go into a lap village as I did in the winter and they're all uh, drunk and it's a terrible problem um, I preached at a church there and the church warden was a lap and uh, he was supposed to, have, uh, supposed to have arranged the, um, uh, the hymns you know, put up the numbers for the hymns and there were no hymns so I had to give them out and there was uh, this custodian of the church was nowhere to be seen and suddenly the big oak doors opened and in came uh, the uh, custodian, a fine member of the church, like this, uh, and slammed the doors back. And then he went up, to, although the, the service was halfway open, he went up to the hooks uh, and got the, uh, the uh, numbers and tried to hang the, <laughs> the numbers on the hooks and missed every time and uh, the whole church burst out into laughter and the poor minister who was a stranger there and didn't know the lap ways he, did, he was looking and didn't know what to do the poor man he was red in the face um, 
and um, sadly uh, you find whole villages like that absolutely drunk and it, it, it's quite a tragedy hmm. yes but you were right there and time is up time is up and we're very time oriented yes oh yes I know